little bit of context on, on the why we're here and this uh, conversation for today. So in November last year, when uh, the game team was thinking about you know, what's women entrepreneurship in India like, what's the landscape, we started on a journey of conversations with as many stakeholders who would possibly engage with us. In all the conversations, there were three things that emerged consistently as a trend. The first one was everybody defined a woman entrepreneur differently. Um, if I spoke to a government representative, someone from the private sector, or a woman entrepreneur herself, her definition of what entailed that did not match. The second was there seemed to be very little data on actually understanding where the women entrepreneurs are, what's the output like, where do they coalesce, what do they need. It was all disparate. Uh, and also a lot of proxies, and not necessarily the best proxies that we used. And the final uh, piece of input that we always got was this idea of there's huge potential in women entrepreneurship. That women are going to unlock these 150 to 170 million jobs, they're going to accelerate the economy. But at the same time, that story didn't line up with the fact that there was no data to substantiate how they're going to unlock these jobs. So that was the starting point of this conversation around how do you, who is a woman entrepreneur? Definitionally, how do you measure this? Is there a measurement tool? And in that context, we reached out to the LEAP team, who's you know tremendous and they've already done fantastic work in thinking through things like scorecards and measurements. And they of course put together some mechanism to start with. And uh, with luckily with the blessings of the Maharashtra state government, we pitched the idea to them and now they'll be the first state in the country to pilot a scorecard on women entrepreneurship. Now, we also realized fairly early on that that is a, it's nice to measure, of course, because then you, data is a very powerful enabling tool. What do you do with that information? Uh, data can be a way of informing policy making, measuring how legislation is doing. And in that context, we then reached out to the TQH team, led by Aprajita, about is this a subset of something larger? What would a woman entrepreneurship policy in the country look like? So globally, there are only about 13 countries who have a policy which sort of brings together everything that they have in their country around women entrepreneurship under an overarching umbrella. Even the United States adopted their policy in 2019. And it does very much what we're attempting to do, which is stitch together disparate pieces, different schemes, different ideas that have worked, and with the goal of advancing sort of enabling conditions. And so that's the second piece of work we're doing. Now, while it's great to pilot this in Maharashtra, we still have two huge challenges in front of us. One is, it's not a mainstream idea, and we really need it to be picked apart. We think it's cool, like a lot of things, uh, but you really need to have public heft, validation, and thinking around, does this idea make sense? Uh, the second is, it is, while expert views are, you know, really are necessary to frame the context of the problem statement, it also needs update from all parts of the ecosystem. And part of this conversation today is going to help us think through that and also help you see if this idea makes sense and then for you to take it forward. So with that, uh, I'm going to ask Sairi to just give us a quick overview of the landscape of women entrepreneurs because that's a good place to start. Sairi is the founder of Shiro's and Mahila Money, which is a new bank. She engages all kinds of entrepreneurs, of course, online, rural, urban, definitional issues are possibly her mainstay. So over to you, Sairi. Thank you so much, Sajna, and uh, really glad to be in this room. Just a lot of partners, collaborators, friends here. Uh, so I think, uh, thinking from what, what you said, Sajna, a little bit of what we do, we're really building what I call women's internet, and we hope that translates into employment, entrepreneurship, and access to capital for women. This journey started in 2014, 2015, so it's not new, uh, but it started in a very different market. It started when maybe 10 million women were online, and probably only a handful had a smartphone. And I think two two things stand out from my experience as a founder. One, entrepreneurs are in every home, you know. So I think the fact is we are we are an entrepreneurial country, but women particularly do not identify themselves as entrepreneurs very easy, you know, and that's something that starkly came out in so many years ago. Uh, it reminds me from, uh, it reminds me of a scene from English Wingdish, where Sri Devi has a home business and she's, she actually runs it, she makes money, but it, it took a trip to America to say, uh, Yahan pe mujhe entrepreneur hai. 
And I think that's a case for millions and millions of women who do something that's productive, is probably generating an income or is generating an output, but is not qualified as entrepreneur, you know, or on enterprise or or startup or business. And I think that's one shift we are seeing. Second, of course, um, we are now probably the largest digital country in the world. We we are better digital payments, we are be better digital stack, and I think we have a lot more digital aspirations than any other country in the world. And to me, that's a big, big trend we all need to follow and we all need to sort of keep in mind as we design whatever we design, whether it's policy or products or you know, <coughs> research. Uh, and third thing that I personally believe in is if you want to make something uh, popular or if you want everybody to adopt it, it has to be consumerized. And I think a lot of entrepreneurship historically was very siloed, you know, or at least entrepreneurship in the traditional sense of the word was very siloed. And a lot of trends we see is that, and there's so many parallel sessions in this, in this uh, uh, event today which are talking about those, so whether it's solopreneurs or gig workers or, or people setting up sectoral outcomes. But what's happening is there is, a, there is a consumerization of entrepreneurship that's happening. And I think we're all going to play a role in different ways. Uh, and of course, the other thing that's happened is the ecosystem that supports it, you know, so whether it's payments or whether it is uh, policies, policies are still a lot, lot behind in terms of how they think of entrepreneurship. But when you when you look at the stack of entrepreneurs, I see three very distinct sets: the solopreneur, the micro entrepreneur, the woman who runs that neighborhood beauty parlor and that boutique and the yoga studio and the bakery studio. There's somebody who does a little more service business a little. That's what government recognizes the most. The SMB, the SME, the, the slightly more registered business is probably a service business or a manufacturing business. And the third is, of course, tech startups, which is, I think we all know what, what that is. Uh, and of course, I think the base is where majority of our work is. If we need to sort of catapult our, ourselves, I think that's where some interesting work lies ahead of us. But just, I'll, I'll stop here and we'll come back to this. Thanks. So my next question is to Sharon, um, of course the expert in all things data, and I really want Sharon to unpack for us just how complicated everything around measuring who is a woman entrepreneur, what the barriers are, um, and what kind of measurements already exist. Um, over to you. Um, that's a very huge task to do. I don't think I would qualify necessarily as expert, not more than many people in this panel or even the, in the uh, one thing I want to thanks for that introduction. I think that sets a, a right tone. Uh, I also think that um, women entrepreneurship is one of these huge, vast topic where it's the perfect storm in the sense that we expect so much. So you want to empower women. You want them to contribute to the economy. Uh, you want them to uh, create jobs and uh, on top of other, other aspects. So where do you start from there? And on top of that, like uh, my colleague here on the panel articulated, a lot of them are not necessarily positioned in that space. So that also means that what do you want to capture in terms of data? Uh, in terms of data, and, and when I talk about entrepreneurship, this is particular to entrepreneurship in general, but even more specific to women when there are intersectionality about it. So you want to capture that because there's use like a social context where you know you have to defy, defy actually what it means as well to be a woman entrepreneur from all steps of the way. And I think the, the, the barrier and the challenges could vary in degree, but they're almost the same for a, a woman who's a home-based business or a woman who has to in front of a VC uh, cap. We see person trying to get huge equity, you know. So when you hear about that, there is education on all level where to start. I think the store card to measure is, uh, I would say, a logical thing. Someone who loves to measure data. I will take also the step that all models are flaws. Some are useful. So I would say all scorecard flaws might be flawed, but some are useful. You have to start where you want to be. As well, noting as well that uh, I I have been in India for 14 years, but I, when I have to explain India. Everything is in the extremes. It is never the average. You have to look at the min and the max and to see how this function. Because you want to regress to the mean, uh, you don't understand uh, the context. So when you want to look at data, where do you start? How do you measure and what do you want? 
So I would say the logical thing to do is to first, it's a multiple scorecard, so which variables can you capture from a business perspective? Those could be available. But if you look at other dimensions, uh, there's a lot of survey data that the government produces that we can, and those are really articulated in some of our scorecards that we mentioned. There could be some administrative data. What really uh, missing is an aggregation of data in several spaces. I think uh, the convergence, and this is a problem not only entrepreneurship, this is a problem in several government agencies, I would say, uh, who works as well in government. How do you pull that data together? And I think there are ways in, in, in looking at technology as well. This could certainly enable, these are really low hanging fruits that we can see if we can better understand where all the data sources are and how can we pull them in a meaningful way uh, without reinventing the wheel. I think the low hanging fruits are there. Uh, the scorecard we had mentioned, you know, the various dimensions from a business perspective. So when you look at a little bit putting numbers to um, uh, women entrepreneurship, there's probably 15 million in this country. So from a statics perspective, uh, when you look at data, whatever data we have now will capture that. But if you want to start capturing, like how do you increase the flow of women entrepreneurship, you need another set of variables. How do you encourage women entrepreneurship? So that data we might not necessarily capture. So we need to think, you know, is it in terms of like, you know, how many training, how many women, are registered into MBAs? How do you encourage the flow of entrepreneurship? In which space can you, can you look at it? And even from a static perspective, which a scorecard often is a very static view, out of that 50 million, probably 60% are in the space where you had mentioned, you know, uh, these women who have a business at home, et cetera. What is the data we can collect on them? But as well, what is the, that one or two percent of women who are actually more than five employees? I think it's a different type of scorecard, but you can't have a scorecard catch all. You might want to have some variables that sort of try to track, you know, how much equity or fund are these women able to get. So you have looking at the whole traction. So you have to look at how many people are flowing into entrepreneurship. Once they are entrepreneurs, how are they able to grow to sustain? And you know, how do you make sure that there's an the environment to mature the growth of these? Compounded to that, I would add one thing. Uh, Looking at, uh, especially when you look at entrepreneurship scorecards, like I mentioned, you do it once a year at static. But I would say being an entrepreneur is absolutely not a static thing. It's one of the most dynamic environments that you can see. Because there's a lot of micro crisis that people have to face. And because people don't face it in the same time, uh, it looks like on average nothing is happening. But you have to figure out a way to uncover those micro crises and the compounding effect it could have. Or even opposite as well, if you want to create impact, what are those micro things on a daily basis that make a difference that we do not capture? I think those are some of the variables in the data that um, I think would be um, quite um, helpful to see. So I don't want to say more because I know there's a lot of other people that are <laughs> very busy on the panel that could probably add to what I say. Thank you. So picking up on your thread of intersectionality, my question is to Abhajita. And we've had this conversation before. And it was the example of how women entrepreneurship typically rests in different kinds of ministries, right? So NRL reports a certain number, Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Textile, no one talks to each other, so no one really knows what's going on. Can you share a little bit about your experience in just thinking through the policy, what it could look like, and how does data like this add value? Thank you so much, Sanjana, and thank you for inviting me on this panel. We are all, uh, we are very early on in thinking about what the policy should look like. So please, whatever I say, don't put it against me. The actual policy doesn't look like what I'm uh, speaking now. But uh, I think, uh, as Sharon rightly sort of pointed out, entrepreneurship is a very dynamic situation, and it's a very very organic activity. I mean, everybody, you know, like. I'm on these uh, Facebook groups of women, like these Gurgaon moms, etc. And people are always discussing some ideas or the other, like, you know, I want to start something. So at what point do they start being an entrepreneur? When you started thinking about being an entrepreneur, when you made your first sale, when you have done it for, you know, a few months and you think you will continue, or you may pause and then continue to scale up. And I, and since we've started thinking about the policy, I have started thinking a lot more about the process, even though I'm a woman entrepreneur myself. So I've been through a process myself, but 
I realized that I come from so much privilege that, you know, it was much easier for me. Um, so I think that is something which is what makes it hard to capture data as well because it's a very dynamic, organic sort of a situation. And I think the, uh, the thing that you spoke about, that who is responsible for women entrepreneurship? So Nidhi Ayo, for example, had started a women entrepreneurship platform. And I think the idea of that was to, uh, you know, have all the policies in one place so that people could go to a portal and actually look at what our policies exist for women entrepreneurs. We did this landscape mapping for them and it was uh, visible on their website for two, three years. Uh, when we actually started doing it, we realized that there are so many small, small schemes under so many different kind of ministries at the central government. So I think Saidi rightly kind of pointed out that there are so many at the base level, which are your solo solopreneurs, but I think she gave urban examples, but so many rural examples also, right? Agropreneurs, you have also have tribal women, there are women who hold BD, for example, and then sell it. So those are also entrepreneurs. And there are schemes for some of these very specific groups as well, both at the central level and the state level. So when we think about a policy, we are expecting Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of, uh, I don't know, MSME, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Women and Child Development, Ministry of HRD, Ministry of Skill, and I'm sure I'm missing out a few, to work together because there are so many forms of women entrepreneurship. And one thing that government historically does not excel at is driving convergence because it's just so huge. I mean, even big companies are not able to drive convergence and government scale is next level. But I think when, you know, uh, game, uh, started discussing this idea, we thought that women entrepreneurship is not the only subject where this seems like an impossible situation. There are so many other things where a lot of things need to come together. For example, our foreign trade policy or for example, our urban policy or education policy where there are multiplicity of institutions and that should not stop us from at least laying out the vision so that each actor at least knows what can be done. And that's the hope of, you know, working towards a policy, but we are very early on. And if we have time, I would like to just talk about a basic framework we have, and then hopefully get some feedback. Thanks. No, we'll come back to that. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Niharika. So there's a wonderful podcast that both she and Sharon have spoken on called Invisible Women. And in it, she, she says something very interesting around you know, the definitional issues around self-employed versus uh, you know, women who have, or actually job creators. Now, most of the context and conversation in our country today around unlocking women entrepreneurs is the idea of being job creators. But we're not even able to go from zero to one. Now, you uh, at DSU are also leading like the Women Works program and you've got extensive experience. So what is your just thinking around the movement from zero to one? When you think about measurement, should you even start there or just focus on the job creators? Um, I think um, both as a researcher and as somebody who's worked in this area for some time, uh, the first question that often comes to my mind is, uh, why do we really want to talk about women entrepreneurship? Right? Uh, entrepreneurship is entrepreneurship. Uh, and, and do we really need a scorecard, you know, especially for women? Uh, especially women on. My sense is that uh, while I may not agree that we need a full scorecard, but I think there is certain requirement for looking at women entrepreneurs separately because there is a disadvantage and there is a handicap with which a lot of the, uh, the women work with. Uh, so for example, uh, starting from the, the high tech uh, deep impact IT kind of businesses. Uh, it doesn't matter even if there are more women in engineering colleges today than as compared to some of the other colleges, the number of women who are starting up is definitely very low. Uh, the number of women who possibly get funded uh, or when they go into funding is very low. Uh, the number of women who, um, you know, for example, we were, uh, with my PhD student, we've been running an experiment 
on looking at uh, what is the right number for have, you know for making sure that the men and women in the group discussion uh, will actually make a fair decision uh, for a startup. And so for that, we need both men and women to sign up for the experiment. And interestingly, uh, women don't sign up for the experiment. They forget about participating in it. They don't even sign up for the experiment. And when we push, 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 they sign up for the experiment, they just don't show up for the experiment. And these are MBA college students from IMA, IMB, IMC, IMM. So it's fascinating that these two girls are not even part. Women, not girls, but women are not even wanting to participate in an experiment around funding. Yeah, And this is about funding of startups and we say this fairly clearly. And then when we have, we've now run our experiment with whatever numbers we have, uh, it is fascinating to see that definitely when there is a minority woman in the group, uh, her uh, presence in the group is depressed. And what is most exciting, what is most interesting and possibly intriguing is the fact that when there is a minority man in the group, the man is like the hero. Yeah? His voice is heard the most, his, uh, his decision is the one that is influencing the most and so on and so forth. So it is fascinating how women themselves treat themselves uh, in, in their own groups. And then of course, when we go into the context of women in the um, rural setups, women in the poorer uh, communities, uh, definitely from the study that we did with IWH and my own, uh, my own work with SEVA, uh, Ila Ben's work, uh, understanding of it, um, women are no less capable but the handicap that they have for even stepping into the entrepreneurship domain is very, um, is very huge. And in fact, we've looked at uh, you know, literacy in terms of mobile, digital literacy. Women are not poorer than men, but their own, their own wish to use some of this for their business seems to be very different. So all I'm trying to say is that um, while I would personally not like a women entrepreneurship all-encompassing policy. I would like an entrepreneurship policy which says, how do we get people who don't necessarily show up in this have a space? But I also, having looked at the board experiences of getting women on boards, I think some kind of um, uh, benchmark as to we need that many women to be there uh, definitely makes a difference. Um, so I, I think given the fact that we have such a handicap, given the fact that uh, there aren't as many people to encourage, and given the fact that we as women don't feel very comfortable about having some of these conversations, uh, some kind of a special light that shines on it will possibly make us a lot more um, interested to look at. And therefore, at the, the Women Works, what we said is that um, what we need to do is we need to go to the women who are sitting in the context that they're already sitting in. Uh, we can't expect them to actually move out of those contexts and come out. So we need to go to them. We need to go to them not with the lens that um, let me help you, but to actually say, what is it that you know already? What is it that you can do with what you know already? And therefore, like every other business person, uh, man or woman, when they run a business, they need people to support them from all quarters. Can we create that support system, which includes maybe uh, you don't know how to fill this form, let me show you how to do it. Uh, which includes maybe uh, you don't know what are the three company acts that need to be followed, let me show you what to do about it. Which, in, which includes maybe saying, um, this is how you make a pricing decision. Right? Um, which are very sophisticated decisions, they're not easy for anyone to make. Any, uh, you know, even MBA graduates um, uh, kind of have difficulty with it. So can I help you make a pricing decision? Can I help you make a connect? So I think, yes, there is need for help. There is need for support. There is need for policy 
which will make it easier for women to have access to some of these things. But I don't think we need women only. Um, and that's it. Last thing I want to say is, and I'll, I'll come back later if there are questions, is that I think any measurement is difficult. But I personally believe measurement is important because, you know, as has been, it has been uh, said, that like Peter Drucker said that, actually he didn't say it, but somebody else said it, but the, the, the quote is famous, what gets measured gets done. Right? And therefore, I think just that measure also has that extra light. And with that extra light that we are shining, we're hopeful that we will be starting to make a move the needle on that. Well said. Thank you. Uh, with that, I want to move to Nidhi, who has actually one of the most unique vantage points. Uh, you, you represent a large foundation and you also bring sort of the private sector perspective into a lot of the work you're doing with a clear technology focus. I think one of the lessons we learned in, in engaging both with you and with others in who, you, who sort of are tech enablers is that you have a much probably sharper handle on measuring at least your beneficiary pool or the programs that you manage. So I think I have a two-part question. One is, what are your thoughts on how ways that you're measuring can be amplified outside of what we are trying to do be amplified within the private sector? And that's the first part. And the second is, with all your work in tech for good, etc., are you seeing tailwinds and trends that might help in any activities that are measuring at scale? Sure. I was under, I was just, uh, after what you know, was saying, just on a lighter note, uh, it would have been great to have a man on the panel to get another perspective also out here. Uh, but uh, so, um, in terms of um, how we are measuring or in terms of data, I think first it's very important to accept and understand why data is important because measurement comes after that. So, um, especially we're talking about uh, a very complex situation out here. We're talking about women, we're talking about entrepreneurs. Right? And, and uh, of course, we have all the data to say that how women entrepreneurs are not actually leading in any way in this country and where, where is the gap. So one, I think, uh, yes, definitely we need to get the data. We need to understand the data to understand behavior. Uh, we need to understand why is there this gap. Uh, we can come up with hundreds of solutions, whether it's tech-based or not tech-based, without and, and it will not be helpful because data becomes extremely important for us to understand culture, background, the gaps, uh, the struggles, and, uh, and also uh, in terms of coming up with solutions. Because uh, if, if uh, just to share with you, um, um, uh, what we have realized is that um, contrary to the belief that women uh, are, are not really uh, forthcoming as well as digital literacy, goes. Uh, what we saw the change in some of the programs that NASCOM Foundation does is that in the last two years, uh, earlier we had 65% of our beneficiaries as men who were becoming digitally literate. Sorry, 75% of the beneficiaries were men. And in the last two years, the figure has changed to 65% beneficiaries as women. So it is what women are coming out uh, to do so that data is helping us to understand that a woman wants to move forward and the last two years has changed that definitely so one of course and of course uh, you know in terms of data also helps us to understand the gender stereotyping and the biases of course because that really helps us to understand why the biases are there and what is the role that we can play but coming to how we are measuring is definitely there's nothing to be technology but have we reached there? No, we haven't reached there, right? Uh, so again, a country of our size, the, the complex situation, the numbers that we are looking at without technology, it is not possible to collect this data. It is not possible to uh, analyze this data. And of course, uh, um, it's not possible to use this data. So uh, yes, uh, we have started integrating technology as well as in terms of uh, so everything in terms of a couple of new programs that we are launching, we are making sure that the data, in partnership with other partners, uh, we are ensuring that the data is uh, of our, um, whether it is a digital literacy program or a women or a skill -like program, it is linked to an app or a platform where everything comes in one go out there and further, you know, certain data that we will collect and we can further understand the, uh, the trends and what is the impact of it. So this is work in progress. Uh, there are many examples of how others are already doing it, but yes, technology definitely can.
can play a, a role in uh, ensuring that the data is collected, used, analyzed. And of course, uh, my biggest thing is it's create, it takes away, of course, it's a controversial topic, but it takes away the biases from, from, the, from the data, right? So, uh, and something that we really need in the women's space, women entrepreneurship space. So I do a second part of the session also, yeah? I'm very quickly going to request Rajita to share what she's thinking about her framework and then open it up to questions that anyone may have. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm a consultant, so I must offer a framework. Uh, otherwise, this panel will not be complete. But basically, uh, we thought that you know there are people in the room who may who have worked with women very closely, and these are some of the things that we've been thinking about, and we've just started working on this. Uh, but I thought that you know this is a good place to discuss some of these. So when we were thinking about, of course, there is a big debate about who is the women entrepreneur, like how many kind of women entrepreneurs exist. But there are some things that every woman entrepreneur needs, no matter what level, size, scale they are at. And we were trying to distill what these uh, things are. And I think a lot of literature also exists around it. Like the Brain has uh, done a report around women entrepreneurship, and many other countries have also thought about it. So we were thinking that from a woman's perspective, what do you need to become a woman entrepreneur? So one is motivation slash willingness which I think a lot of thinking is around in terms of entrepreneurship mindset, skilling with the Delhi government is doing at the school level, but also there's thinking around how it needs to be done at the college level, even at the skilling centers, etc. So those type of things, even having mentors um, and some examples, a lot of IEC activities probably need to be a part of it. I mean, I, I'm not going into solutions, but what needs to be fixed. Then skills, which include both technical skills as in what are you trying to sell, whether it's a, a service or you know a product, so the ability to make that product, and soft skills, because once you have the first person working for you or you need to make your first sale, that's when your soft skills also come in, which is pretty early on in your uh, entrepreneurship journey. Financial access, I think there have been lots of panels today which have spoken about it. And I think with financial access, there is already that government light on getting women that access. But there also we could benefit from richer data. For example, when we were looking at Mudra data, which is one of their key schemes, there is data around say, you know, 40% loans are going to women. But for what kind of businesses, we do not know. So that is not captured. So we are not able to see where are where is that organic entrepreneurial activity already happening. Uh, so that richness of data is missing from financial access and then of course there's a huge principal agent problem wherein basically banks have to give certain loans but they will only give it to you if you give them collateral which I think everybody knows. There's social capital which I think women really because of our I guess uh, general society, social culture, women have much lesser social capital mostly uh, but they also have a different kind of social capital which they use sometimes very creatively which is the networks in local areas etc. Uh, but they may not have access to market. So I think that is something that um, needs to be worked upon. And apart from all this, there are these broader things which are enablers, right? Which is your broader economic opportunity around us. And that is not something that is just about women entrepreneurship, but it is uh, tied to geography, it is tied to macroeconomic indicators, it is tied to what direction generally technology is taking, etc. So all of the different new opportunities will come with where the macroeconomic situation is sort of changing. But we also think that it covers things like ease of doing business. Now ease of doing business is important for men and women, but it's very important for women because running from pillar to post to get your registration, certifications, if you want to open a restaurant, that will put off many more women than it will put off any more men. So, but those are things which are macro in nature and they are enablers. And for women, what is very relevant is social infrastructure like childcare facilities, etc. Because, um, I mean, 
we can we do have the time you survey now with nsso and you know we know that women spend a lot more time on uh, care um, care yeah 10 times more right so we we have to lessen that burden for them to become entrepreneurs or even step into the workforce so that social infrastructure including i would say incubation now in this case we are in fact right now working on a, a paper with IBH, uh, which is housed under Akrama Lead, on what is in, how do we make these incubation centers gender responsive? What are the features that need to be there, even in these sort of co-working areas, etc., so that women feel more comfortable using that kind of infrastructure? If there's any questions, we'd love. All right. Yes. Uh, I just want to understand that a woman, you know, uh, in my experience. When somebody asks her to use her abilities or the man or the family, say you can use, you know, this is the money and you can do this kind of business or, you know, some semi business or whatever. So uh, the initiative is taken not by the woman largely. I mean, in my experience, but somebody prompts her to do that. First question. Second is, in, you know, in earning, whether it's livelihood or entrepreneurship, how much she has the financial decision-making power, these two elements. So, um, I'm just trying to understand the question. You're saying that women lack motivation or a lot of pushes coming from men. Sorry, can you repeat your question? I, I mean, I'm not saying that they lack. And I'm not saying that they... How do we incentivize? Is that what you're saying? Yes. I mean, the direction or uh, the initiative taking, you know, Absolutely. abilities, how, how limited or in your experience or... Yeah. Yeah. So, look, I think the truth is for every uh, one number that I want to point out, India has one of the lowest women in formal workforces number. And part of the reason is because every woman who has a job has another job. So it doesn't matter whether you have a paid job, but you already have a job that you're, you're running 24-7, 365. It never ends and it grows as your family grows and, uh, and all of that. I think uh, a lot of women are guarded about their business amongst their families. You know, I run a near bank and one of the promises we make to women is it won't involve a member of your family. And I think because it's got to do with social capital and it's got to do with your identity, at least a woman wants to own that business. Most women in India don't come from assets. The family is not made inheritance in their name. When they go to uh, their in-laws family, they probably you know, you, you belong nowhere. I think most women live with that feeling, especially when it comes to money, assets, access to capital. So one of the promises we make is no, no man needed, no family member needed. This decision's yours and it's collateral free. And so we do take a bit of risk there. But if this capital becomes a lot more easier, I don't have to do the rounds of a bank 40 times. I don't have to bring family balance sheet and assets it'll get easier for a lot of women. So I think a lot of this is incentive structures and how they play out in a really, look, most ecosystems that created entrepreneurship happened because capital became abundant and there was a lot of support available to say, this is how you make your decisions. Um, uh, this is just a question to all the panelists. Um, it, I mean, the one key takeaway from this conversation has been that it's the lack of data a, on being able to identify women, where women entrepreneurs are, what they're working on, which sectors they are in, is one of the most daunting challenges we're facing as we're trying to solve for uh, increasing the number of women entrepreneurs in the country and solving for their gender specific challenges. I just want to pose a sort of open-ended question that in an ideal scenario, what is the data that you would like to see out there in the ecosystem to be able to best identify? Because I know like, from this working in you know, some amount of research, for example, through existing surveys like the PLFS or other indicators, it's really hard to segment, differentiate between women that are self-employed versus those engaging in entrepreneurial ventures. It's hard to find out which sectors they are concentrated in and how to solve for it accordingly. So what are the kind of indicators or what are the kind of data points you would like to have available to you to better do what you're doing? I can start, but I think many people in the panel can remember can, uh, can that. So first of all, I think, uh, uh, like Nerika mentioned, I think the scorecard, you have to start by measuring something. I think this is the way to go the scorecard. One thing I think you can proceed logically in the sense that uh, the data available for the women today that you want to study is probably mostly available in five states where women entrepreneurship is dominant. And in those five states, I can, you can get reasonably enough data to start something. 
And uh, I think uh, you need to measure somewhere, but you also need to understand what you want to measure. So I would start by the low-hanging fruit of like the more the pure business model, like women who have more economic entrepreneurial activities. But it's very critical to also measure the flow of women. And uh, women who are doing semi-entrepreneurial activities at home, it's even more critically important that now even the definition of work, work from home, digital work, where does that lie? So that there's not even an answer for the general population yet, uh, let alone for women. So I would start almost like a, more logically, okay, this is what we can measure for certain. What can we add value to it? What, what can we start understanding the soul? Like I mentioned, I think my first point was like, a lot, lot of things are flawed, but some are useful. So you, you have to combine uh, what you have to, together. After that, uh, combining with Aparicha mentioned that you can start with a few governments to figure out you know, how to go about. I would not start by boiling the ocean. I would start by making waves in certain areas so you can sort of like start uh, like diving or whatever, like, uh, surfing. Uh, and I think it's critical to understand the segmentation that uh, Sari started with is so critical in understanding this. Because your flow of future women entrepreneurs will come from these non-five states that don't have women who are particularly part of the economic definition of entrepreneurship. So for those states, you probably need to look at more the social data. You need to know like, you know, uh, poverty rates, you need to know schooling education and things like that. And you need to understand measurement of flow into entrepreneurship activities as opposed to pure entrepreneurship activities. In a sense, and I think uh, the ability, I think digital, like you mentioned, I think everyone bought a portion because I, I think digital is the way to, to uh, and I, I don't think digital is a silver bullet, but it certainly helped to advance a lot of things together and data, I think, how to put those systems in a concise way. And I would say as well, uh, data in itself, even scorecards are useful only if they are acknowledged and used for decision making. So I think that has to be a critical link even like a, a, a whatever we have as the scorecard, if it start to be entertained, then it'll be co-created, and then that's where also you'll have convergence. I, I, I'll ask anybody else who would facilitate. Do you want to add? Go to your hand. Just one last. I think uh, while it could be very nice if we had actually thought through what our ideal data set should look like, uh, my I haven't thought through that. Uh, but I think it's important that no matter what data gets collected, it be gender marked. I think that is a good starting point. So whether it is Mudra alone, whether it is whatever, why couldn't we just say how many men, how many women, how many women access it? We are given take 50% of the population, it might just be okay to you know figure out who is doing what. Uh, and I think that would be a good starting point for any data that gets collected by any body. NSSO, ISSO doesn't matter. Absolutely. I think just a last point to this that we've learned uh, in thinking through a scorecard is very rightly, like you said, it has to tie into policy making. But the also the double edged sword to this is like other scorecards. The light that you shine doesn't always show you a pleasant picture. It's not going to show you a great picture for some years to come. So then there's the worry of, you know, will this information be weaponized? Will my state look bad? Will I look bad? So it's an interesting mix that we're now navigating through. Hi, I just wanted to like follow up on the first question that was asked um, based on the framework that you just gave. Um, so I come from national education and I'm a psychology graduate. So motivation and incentivizing people is something that is something I've learned very deeply. But um, one thing that stands out to me most is when we talk about women entrepreneurs, we have to talk about resilience. Because uh, it's a lot about how there was a slide that also said that um, Women entrepreneurs usually come out of necessity and not of aspirations, especially from tier two, tier three cities. So, what are some strategies that you have seen actually be successful in building resilience in women entrepreneurs? Because uh, I feel like a lot of times we focus a lot on motivation and support, but resilience and endurance sort of thing gets left behind in a lot of the way of that process. Because there's only also like so much we can do from our sense of capacity. So, if there's anyone who could this way. I love the question. Uh, so I think uh, we all know entrepreneurship is hard, right? Still, so many of us want to do this. So clearly, there must be something. I think there is uh, there is a promise of wider disproportionate rewards, disproportionate recognition, or just plain survival. I think these are fundamental reasons why we you know become entrepreneurs, whosoever we are. I think. Uh, 
for from whatever we've learned working with women in communities, social capital is one of the biggest motivators. So, yahan pe mujhe entrepreneur bulate. It means something. My name is on this. Second is just financial incentives, and I think we can we can actually hack financial incentives, and we can disproportionately you know, if we change access to capital, and we said. You know, tax holiday for women entrepreneurs for 10 years in this country. See the numbers change, right? So, you know, we are humans. We are we work with incentives. You know, so incentives matter. And third is, I think a lot of resilience comes from your own communities. You know, Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley because the community is so strong. You need somebody to listen to you, handhold you. You know, you know, host a nice tea evening so that you can sit and chat. And I think. Entrepreneurship is the same. Its resilience comes when when you can do this. It doesn't matter whether it's in a five star or in a several group or whether it's online. You need that space, and it says, "Oh, I'm not alone. Everybody has the same trouble." Okay, it's all good. Thank you. Add one thing. I think Sally, you've covered it all. I would just add one thing, especially in case of women, that social infrastructure. that they do not drop out from whatever they are doing to take care of children or old people i mean and there is a huge government role in that and that's just not for women entrepreneurship but generally women's labor force participation as well i would add that also in in entrepreneurship i mean every entrepreneur needs to be resilient but if you have these uh, factors which lead women to drop out from that that shouldn't be there so that is also okay go ahead I think I'll just pick up what I said earlier about the panel. So I think, um, and that's my gender lens out here. So it's it's, it's you talking about social infrastructure and support. That's where I think one key factor is uh, the men supporting it because right. whether it is from finance point of view or overall long term support. So I think that becomes a very important factor out here in terms of if you look at long from a long term point of view and them not dropping out. That kind of a support, whether from Family support or from finance support or external support that becomes very important, and we know that there are whether it's workforce or in the entrepreneurial area, it's maximum men. So whether you're going to a bank to get a finance or you're going to get from selling your product, it's the men that are going to do it. So that kind of a support, acceptance, and removing your biases becomes equally important in that. Thanks, thanks, Ali.